Thanks, Peter. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for the opportunity to be here and to be part of this uh, great symposium, and thanks for Itamar for their support. Um, Mickey set uh, a great stage to continue to talk about endothelial function as a marker for secondary prevention. There is a lot of overlap between primary and secondary, but I will try to focus in my talk mainly about secondary. And start with this case of 50 year old young man with this evidence of cardiovascular risk factors, history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, quit smoking 20 years ago, normal cardiac examination. He's on atrovastatin, 80 milligram with baby aspirin, mildly overweight, a BMI of 28.5. This is uh, this person. This is this person's uh, laboratory uh, result. Total cholesterol, HDL 39, LDL 62, GFR 45, CRP is normal. And the question we have, what's the risk of this patient for future cardiovascular event? And how would you determine the risk? So if we look at this patient and we look at it currently on this, most of the people in the audience will say that this is primary prevention risk about 7 8% if we have any event. Let's change the patient a little bit. And instead of a, uh, uh, talking about primary prevention, just say that this patient has uh, acute coronary syndrome and PCI with drug alutin stand two weeks ago. Now you look at this patient completely different, and now the risk of this patient is not 8%. So what happened to this patient just from being primary prevention to secondary prevention? So in spite of his patient normal lipid level, we look at two major studies, A to Z, and approve it. Both of these relate to this patient, showing that the risk of having any event on this patient jumped to about 22% over a year in spite of the normal, almost normal cholesterol level. And here, and here the mid -cholesterol, median cholesterol level in this study was 66, and here's 106. So here is a patient, secondary prevention, post ACS, with almost normal on atrovastatin and here on statin uh, treatment, still have a high risk. And the question is, what are we missing in this patient? And can we trust this goal of lipids to uh, predict this patient event? So we're puzzled by this phenomenon, and I will bring this study that it's a fascinating study that came uh, two years ago in, in Nature that asked the same question, but asked it in the animal model, and it's maybe related to what we're talking today. So it's, we know that new myocardial ischemia have occurred in 54% of the patient after the first year after MI, in spite of aggressive and guidelines therapy. And they set an experiment to test, to see what the mechanism is, what's the cause of the atherosclerosis. So they took this model of the mice, creating an ACS, and showed that in the ACS itself, the event itself, is a huge trigger for progression of the atherosclerosis and plaque rupture. So when we have a patient with ACS, the event itself, it's a trigger event, and I'm not going to go into the mechanism of uh, where the cells are moving, but in a sense, this is a trigger by itself, and you cannot treat this patient as an innocent patient or innocent case like a primary prevention. So the event itself is a trigger for future myocardial infarction. From epidemiological study, we know that even in secondary prevention, in spite of treatment, you still have a high rate of event. And here you have a zero risk uh, intervention in primary secondary trial, still have high level of event, even with the, uh, aggressive treatment. So we need some tools to reclassify and assess the risk of this patient. And generally, multiple studies, including we know that a lot of patients with coronary disease, 77% that have normal cholesterol. We know from this study that uh, there is a duration and variation in the uh, in response to uh, event that trigger acute coronary syndrome that nothing to do with the cholesterol or other risk factors. Some biomarkers fail to predict that. And even in the PROSPECT study that was an invasive ultrasound study, they didn't see how to predict the future event even by invasive images. So how do we operate now in secondary deprivation? We have this colorful table that I'm sure all of us are using on a daily basis, and we have guidelines. But if we look at this, the baseline, actually, the major parameters of secondary promotion remain with a lot of overlap with primary. Smoking, blood pressure, lipid management, physical activity. We don't have any tool specifically to assess the risk of patients with secondary prevention. 
So how do, we, how do we assess the risk of the patient? How do we know that this patient is vulnerable or not? So we have surrogate risk markers, high cholesterol, hypertension, smoking, diabetes, and biomarkers, but they're actually not the disease. They are biomarkers tell us there is a risk. But we have now tools to have direct imaging of the disease. We can do carotid ultrasound to look at plaque. There was some discussion of coronary calcium. And we can have some dynamic tests, which is endotier function. So which test would you use to assess the risk of the patient? The test should, be, should make scientific sense, should make, somehow participate in the disease. A marker at a different stage of the disease, not only good for one stage, primary, secondary, it has to apply to multiple stages of the disease. What said here, it has to reflect reversibility, and that's what Peter commented on. You need to have a tool that tell you, yes, I did the good job, because it's almost impossible or impossible to reverse coronary calcification. And it serve as a risk factor, not only as a risk marker. It has to have plain the disease, and it has to have a marker. So we talk about endotear function here, and it, this slide just show the multiple effect of endotear function. We shouldn't focus only on the vasoconstriction, vasodilatation. This is just a tool for us to assess the endotear function. It has multiple effects that has to do with smooth muscle cell proliferation, locosid adhesion, lipid peroxidation, oxidative stress, platelet reactivity, and progenitor cells function. So it's a marker for us, it's a window for us to look at all this process of patient vulnerability. So Mickey showed these two major tests that are currently non-invasive tests for endotear function reactive hyperemia and the endopart by Itamar, essentially based on the same mechanism of the response of reactive hyperemia and the de uh, decline in reactive hyperemia represent endothelial dysfunction. So if we want to introduce a test into our practice, and this was a question why endothelial function was not introduced into the practice, we believe that a test should uh, fulfill some of these criteria. It has to be associated with, with corona endothelial function. And this is back to your question. Uh, regarding the relationship with endopath and corona endothelial function, we previously showed that there is a very good correlation between them. The test has to be low risk, it has to be cost effective, no operator dependent, reproducible, easy to use, short duration, and reflect reversibility and predict event. So if we want to introduce a test to our practice, probably we need to look at this and say that this test fulfill this criteria. So how to assess the risk of the patient that we present? So we have endothelial dysfunction represent from us an ongoing risk. We know that or we didn't have any, we have inadequate therapy to this patient, or there is ongoing cardiovascular risk factors and unrecognized cardiovascular risk factors. So we look at this patient, we have endothelial dysfunction, we know it's a marker for us that the patient is still vulnerable for the next event. We need just to figure out what's the mechanism of that and act upon this mechanism. So what evidence do we have to support that what I just said about that? So we have, what is the risk of the current patient that I present? So we have risk of strength thrombosis and wrist stenosis. We have risk of cardiovascular event in this patient. We may be missing some unrecognized risk factors, and we need to know that we provide optimal medical care. So regarding platelet reactivity, which is part of the milieu of uh, vascular and endothelial function, this study from Japan show that there is a good correlation between platelet reactivity and endothelial function. And a, plate, a patient that have high platelet reactivity has a attenuated endothelial function. So for us, it's a marker in spite of the fact that you, we put all our patients on platelet inhibition. Uh, for us, it's, it may be a marker that this patient is not responding to the antiplatelet therapy that we're giving him. What about cardiovascular event? Miki showed a slide from Ronen, and this was mainly in patients with lower Framingham risk factor. Uh, and we asked the question, does it apply to high risk factors like the patient that I presented? So complementary study show from Japan again, showed the relationship of endothelial function in more than 500 patients with high cardiovascular risk. And they assess endothelial function with the endopath and measured before coronary angiography and coronary uh, complexity was used the syntax score. So here we see that the, the presence of endothelial dysfunction had an additive effect on the syntax score. So you can have a patient with the same syntax score but completely different event rate. They can have the same syntax score, but if they have endothelial dysfunction, they have high, relative, high uh, uh, event rate. 
And this is true overall with endothelial dysfunction. So not only the patient with primary prevention, patient with secondary prevention with a high degree of coronary disease, endothelial dysfunction also is a good predictor of event. Is that prevalent or not? Are we just talking about a rare phenomenon? This is a, a study we're just finishing now, about 400 uh, patients following acute coronary syndrome. And all the patients underwent uh, endothelial function testing and sleep studies. And this just show you the prevalence of endothelial dysfunction and sleep uh, uh, studies, sleep abnormalities in patients uh, following acute coronary syndrome. We focus here on the smoking, on the heart failure, and, and the cholesterol, but the incidence of continuous patient vulnerability is high. And I know that Giora is going to talk about sleep, but I just want to raise the issue that it is ongoing risk factor. So the vulnerable patient with endothelial dysfunction not only represent to us does this vessel dilate or constrict, it presents to us a multifunction disease that can be renal failure, metabolic syndrome, sleep apnea, and we need to detect which risk factors are we missing. Regarding sleep, Giora is going to talk about it, but in general, endothelial dysfunction is a sort of a surrogate for sleep apnea, and I think we're underestimating the prevalence of sleep apnea and the significance of this on cardiovascular event. Renal failure is another risk factor that we are missing because we keep looking at the same. And again, this study uh, with patients with chronic kidney disease and endothelial function was performed showing that the presence of uh, uh, endothelial dysfunction in this patient is a highly predictive of future cardiovascular event. So it's for us, it's a marker that our treatment or our detection of risk factors is not complete. Do, can we use endothelial function to provide optimal medical therapy? This is a study that highly related to the patient I presented. So this is a study of patient with coronary disease, and the patient were all treated with statin to the same level of cholesterol level, 71 and 69. These are exactly the patient that we are seeing every day They give them statin. And we believe that we actually achieve a goal. However, if you can see that in the same level of cholesterol and same level of risk factors following with patients with coronary disease and secondary progression, the, the regular risk uh, uh, model failed to pr predict the event. However, the addition of non-invasive endothelial function was highly predictive of cardiovascular event, telling us that it's very simple to look at what we keep looking at, cholesterol and hypertension, but we need to look a little bit deeper even when we achieve a therapeutic and normal cholesterol. And finally, can we uh, target, can we target our therapy based on that? Is it just a marker for us or we can actually see that? So there are two studies, one in primary prevention, one in secondary prevention. Mickey showed you the study on primary prevention, patient without significant coronary disease, uh, hypertension. And again, with a similar reduction in blood pressure, the patient with endothelial dysfunction continue to have event, which keep telling us that we are not achieving the goal. Secondary prevention, a similar story. We should be surprised, or not surprised, based on the data we have, that high percent of the patient, in spite of the guidelines therapy with stable coronary disease, continue to have endothelial dysfunction, in spite of the same blood pressure control, cholesterol control, and risk factor control. The patient, do, is there any difference in their event rate? On the same therapy, on a similar reduction in risk factors, the presence of endothelial dysfunction continuously have, this patient continue to have event, which means to us that in, uh, we are not finishing the job if we just looking at the periphery of risk factors without looking at actually if this patient is continuing to be vulnerable and have event in the future. So I think that endothelial dysfunction, we need the non-invasive, is a very helpful tool to reclassify the patient. And we have two studies that show that in the past, this is 1,000 patients and this is the 3,000 patients from the MESA study showing again that the presence of endothelial function can serve as a reclassification. About 30 to 40% of the patient can be reclassified using this tool to high risk or low risk. And again, as Mickey showed, this is a study that showed a multivariate analysis showing even in secondary prevention that endothelial dysfunction is a high predictor of event. So, uh, and lastly, I just want you to uh, see how we practice, how we use it in our practice. So when we have patients with primary or secondary prevention with the risk factors treated, 
and they have normal endothelial function, we'll continue with the same management. If we have a patient and we treat them and they have endothelial dysfunction, it's a sign for us that there's ongoing CV risk and event. There is ongoing vascular injury in this patient that may continue to present with acute coronary syndrome. So we need to look at other, we need to look at platelet reactivity, presence of sleep, metabolic syndrome, and we can modify the current management until we achieve not only regu regulation of the risk factors, but also normalization of endothelial function. Just to remember, we usually as old as your blood vessel. Thank you. <laughs> Just a reminder if somebody wants to visit us. <laughs> During the summer. No, this is January, this is February, and this is March and April. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amir. It was wonderful. Any questions from the audience to Dr. Lerman? Shmuley? Oh, sorry. Yeah. If we look at the Jupiter study with the apparently healthy patient mean median LDL of 107, and it was the same like you, LDL below 70, but CRP remain high, it's intermediate. It's like you have a high LDL and low CRP. Is there a good correlation between endothelial dysfunction and CRP? You know, so we can use both. It is additive on top of this. And the second is what we do, we still have endothelial dysfunction despite LDL 70, uh, okay. Very, very good question. So regarding the first question, um, regarding the correlation with CRP, um, when the endothelial function error started uh, many years ago, there was a small study about, uh, from Andreas Reir about 20, 25 patients that saw some correlation between coronary endothelial dysfunction and CRP level. Since then, uh, uh, most of the groups that dealt with endothelial function, and I, I'll let Peter also comment, we were not able to find any correlation with endothelial function CRP doesn't mean that the first study was wrong, but it means that it may be look at a different thing. And CRP is more of a, not a specific vascular uh, uh, marker. If you look in the other markers like LPPLA2, you may see in some more uh, correlation. But in general, we didn't see any correlation with CRP uh, in our large uh, database. Uh, the second question about what do you do about it, I usually, usually it's as a marker that I didn't do, I didn't do a completely good job. So if, it depends on, on, for instance, if we talk about women, uh, we usually focus, for instance, on history of polycystic ovaries, uh, we try met metformin, a history of toxemia of pregnancy, uh, stress, things like that. Uh, if it's a secondary prevention, as I said, we're missing majority of the sleep uh, apnea patient. We, we don't look at this. Uh, rheumatoid disease, Im immunological disease can, you know, if you have patient with rheumatoid arthritis with the same cholesterol level, the patient with rheumatoid arthritis has accelerated atherosclerosis, and I think Peter uh, can, can comment on that too. So I think it's, for me, it's a marker that something is, going, something is going wrong and I need to look at this. And so I usually look at that, try to identify the cause, try to treat that, and do another non-invasive endothelial function six months down the road to see. I also, we also use it for patients with chest pain, uh, with normal coronaries, to have a screen diagnosis and to see if we have the right treatment for them. From a practical point of view, um, you, you reduce the LDL and you see that the uh, endothelial function is still uh, reduced and you go to other factors. Do you have information that taking care of all the other factors like sleep apnea, etc., will bring the endothelial function to normal? I, we, we, don't, we have studies from the sleep apnea. I don't want to steal the, the talk from Gira, but from the, from the sleep apnea, there are, there are some studies uh, that uh, I'm sure Gira will show about the uh, treatment of not necessarily directly the, the uh, sleep apnea, but indirectly maybe the mechanism of sleep apnea that improved that. We have studied from uh, uh, health uh, of lifestyle modification that improved endothelial function. We have studied with the allergen in that show that, and, and by the way, back to your question about coronary calcification. If, if you have a patient, the patient has normal endothelial function, the chance of this patient to have coronary calcification is almost zero. So, um, 
Amir, yeah. uh, can you tell us, uh, uh, is there any uh, norms that are different for uh, women versus men for defining normal versus abnormal in utilitarian function? And also, um, is a function of age. I mean, whether you take a 75 years old gentleman and you define what's normal or abnormal, or for example, you take uh, 40 years old. I mean, age and gender. Okay, so okay. Age, let's start with, uh, with age. Um, there is a difference in the literature between FMD and, and endopath, and, and I think these two technologies do not compete with each other. Uh, the FMD more looking at the large vessels, the endopath is more, have more focus on the microcirculation. Um, in the FMD literature, uh, there are several studies in the early stage that show a negative correlation between age and endothelial functions. I mean, in the endopath, uh, the correlation is not that strong. And, and it's actually an advantage because it, not every age has the same effect on the blood flow. So you can, you can have, you can be a 70 with a normal endothelial function, you can be 45 as abnormal, and I think it reflects your risk and vulnerability. Regarding the uh, effect of sex, um, the, there is a difference. We need more patients, but there is a difference in this endoplasm score between men and women. FMD was not, was not that strong. Uh, what we see in our population, there is high incidence, high prevalence of endothelial dysfunction in women versus men, but not necessarily the, their score. And that reflects the higher prevalence of microvascular disease in women. But Amir, in, uh, can I just uh, follow up on this? So if the woman is premenopausal, then you have the additional complexity of, of uh, at least for the brachial reactivity of the number changing during the ovarian yeah. cycle. Uh, have you seen that with endopad also? I think there is study now, uh, they're doing it, uh, look at the variability. Uh, I, I'm not aware of uh, endopad uh, result, but I think in the FMD there was one and on some variability. And also there was some variability about uh, during the day that it, you have more you have more endothelial dysfunction in the early hours of the morning that may reflect why you have more acute coronary syndrome in the early hours of the morning. So. And I would say on the, on, the, on the good part, the question is how do we transition from endothelial function testing for research versus office-based. Okay. And I would say the, fa the issue of fasting, you know, we used to do all these studies in a fasting state. It's probably not as critical as we no. used to think. We used to stop medications. That's probably also not so critical for, for, for doing a study. So I don't know what your opinion is. So uh, for, for fasting, we uh, usually, it depends, and we usually use about two hours of, of fasting for the clinical practice. And for research, it's a little bit different. But uh, we have several machines that are staging in our cardiovascular health clinic, and we use it pretty often. And the same technician that's doing this, the stress test are actually using the endothelial function. So we usually require about uh, two hours of uh, fasting uh, and no smoking, um, not before and not during the test. Um, and uh, um, regarding the medication, I think it depends what the question is. Uh, I think it depends. If the patient is already taking some medication, if we still have a question if this is a risk, we don't discontinue the medication. So we keep the medication. It depends on what the clinical question is. Yeah, Professor Stupin. In recent years, we have more and more data about the impact of renal function on, uh, and, yeah. and on cardiovascular events. And one of the ways that uh, renal uh, function is affecting cardiovascular systems is endothelial function. That's correct. You're right. And uh, uh, the, the most prominent predictor of event in any cardiac study is GFR. I mean, the strongest one forever. And I think if you look at the mechanism of reduction GFR, it has to do with microvascular endothelial dysfunction in the kidney that create, mediated this effect. So I think it does have reflect on multisystemic microvascular endothelial dysfunction. Uh, in, so I think that if you see that, it may give you some kind of a sign that there is, maybe there is some kidney disease there or something that you need to do. You're right. Well, that's great, terrific uh, talk. And uh, thank you very much, Amir. I'd like to invite uh, Giora Pilar from Carmel Medical Center to talk about sleep apnea and endothelial function. Thank you very much. 
I feel a little bit like uh, Safta Bishlad Aisa. Everyone took the time and, uh, and I left with about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, but uh, it should be enough. Um, uh, my role here is to talk about, uh, about uh, sleep and specifically uh, sleep apnea. Presumably this is a disease of sleep because when we are awake, we breathe normally. The, the dilator muscles, pre predominantly the genioglossus, but also the, the soft palate or the tensor veli palatini and other muscles uh, are uh, active and allow a normal uh, breathing and airflow behind it. What happens in these patients during sleep is that they collapse due to the negative pressure uh, generated by the diaphragm and obstruct uh, the airway and the patients uh, suffer from, from uh, apneas. This is how it looks like in a uh, polysomnography. The effort to breathe means that this is not a central problem. They try to breathe, but they are obstructed, so there is no airflow, and they suffer from apnea, 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 until the point where they wake up. This is a sign in the EG of, of arousal, and their sleep is fragmented. They keep on arousing. And uh, with uh, everything that is uh, accompanied with uh, oxygen desaturation, the CO2 accumulation, uh, sympathetic activation, etc. So all of these uh, are the mechanisms that generate uh, the problems in, the, in uh, sleep apnea. We used to do it in polysomnography, as you see here. One of the biggest revolutions, and actually it is a, a revolution in the field of sleep, is uh, moving from uh, in-lab studies into in-home studies, and uh, definitely Itamar Medical is a pioneer in this, both in Israel and in the rest of the world. Uh, many, many uh, sleep uh, centers uh, are now uh, examining sleep apnea in the home, how it should be, because it's a disease of uh, sleep and the patients should sleep in their own environment, and, uh, and this technique uh, is very, very common now. What we do, we measure the severity of sleep apnea by two uh, different measures. Number one is the apnea, hypopnea, or respiratory disturbance index, how many events per each hour of sleep, and what is the minimal oxygen desaturation. The reason that these two uh, measures were chosen as the, as the assessment for the severity is that they have the, they have the best prediction value for uh, complications and uh, mortality. And today I'm going to talk only about one complication uh, because this is the topic of, of us uh, today. And this is the cardiovascular complication and the uh, endothelial function. So this is a, a study back uh, some 10 uh, years ago in Lancet uh, of 12 uh, years of uh, uh, follow-up of patients with untreated sleep apnea. You see it here in red and comparing to all the others with mild or no sleep apnea or treated uh, sleep apnea. And we can see that those with untreated uh, uh, sleep apnea, moderate to severe, have significantly more fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular uh, events. And the mechanism that was back then a hypothesis, but today it is proven, and I'm going to show you some data about it, is that all these interim uh, complications of sleep apnea go through endothelial dysfunction, and this results in, in the cardiovascular complications. And I want to take you uh, into some of the studies that are uh, proving this uh, hypothesis. Uh, some, I, I will show both uh, our own studies and some uh, others. We use uh, the, the reactive hyperemia based on the endopad, but I'll show also some flow-mediated uh, dilatation and other uh, studies. So we, we started to study, the, to study this about uh, 10 years ago. Our first study, we took about 50 patients with uh, obstructive sleep apnea, and we studied their endothelial function both in the evening before uh, they went to sleep and in the morning, the first thing after they woke up. Uh, let me jump uh, through this. Uh, showed the before, and here are the results. This is from our study. This is from a parallel study that was done uh, uh, by Mary Eep. Uh, they did it with the flow media the mediation dilatation uh, in the brachial ultrasound. We did, we did it with the peripheral arterial tonometry. Uh, and both uh, we reported a, a strong negative correlation. The, the worse the sleep apnea is, 
here what you see is the apnea hypopnea index. Uh, as we go to higher numbers, it's more fragmented sleep, more apneas per each hour of sleep, the worse the endothelial function is. Uh, both uh, measured by the uh, PAT and measured by the uh, FMD. Then uh, we studied the, another thing, what happens uh, through the night. This is uh, the endothelial, the average uh, of the group endothelial function in the evening uh, compared to the endothelial function in the morning. Now this is very abnormal. Sleep usually is a has a restorative function. Most of us, most of healthy population, when, the, when we go to sleep, our endothelial, uh, uh, well, every, uh, a lot of uh, functions uh, restore. Among them, also the endothelial function, and the most healthy people wake up with better endothelial function uh, in the morning than in the, in the evening. Not patients with sleep apnea, because they experience throughout the night hypoxemia, reoxygenation, hypercapnia, and sympathetic activation, arousals, all of these uh, um, interim mechanisms damage the endothelial function and they actually wake up in the morning with worse endothelial function than they went to sleep in the evening. Now when we divided the, these patients into two groups, those who had only sleep apnea, you see, it, you see them here in green, compared to those who already have a complication of the cardio, uh, who had at least one uh, cardiovascular event or, or were diagnosed with, with uh, ischemic uh, heart disease, and look what we found. Those with, without cardiovascular with, uh, disease, with only sleep apnea, had a better endothelial function, both in the evening and in the morning, but in these patients we, we saw a strong deterioration overnight. As opposed to those patients who already suffer from cardiovascular disease, their endothelial function is lower to begin with, and the deterioration overnight is, is mild, because probably they have a, a, a floor effect, and their endothelial function is anyway uh, very, very low. So this actually is very encouraging to diagnose and to detect these patients early, as early as uh, we can. And it is uh, substantial and very important because it is reversible to some point uh, or to some extent at, uh, at least. And here, as Amir said, uh, there are several studies showing it. I'll show you some of them. Here is a CPAP treatment three months from our lab uh, uh, before treatment, after three months of uh, CPAP, look at the, uh, the uh, significant improvement in the endothelial uh, function. This is a different study. The, 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 they, I, I should give them the credit. They were the first one who did it uh, from the lab of uh, Mary. They did the uh, patients with sleep apnea with FMD. Then after, after several uh, weeks on CPAP, and then after again several, or sometimes one day, and some, in some of the cases several days without sleep apnea, they deteriorate. So it, it shows a, a, a strong causality between the sleep apnea and, and the, the endothelial function. On CPAP it improves, without CPAP it deteriorates again. Last study that I do want to show, uh, which is very, very important in the field of sleep, but I think also in the cardiology field, is what about not CPAP? CPAP is a very, very difficult uh, uh, treatment to cope with, and the compliance is, uh, re is relatively very low, at least in Israel. In some, in some uh, states it's better. But uh, there is alternative treatment, and here we studied the uh, actually with, uh, with uh, collaborators uh, from, uh, from uh, California, um, a, a different study which is called an oral appliance. This is a herbs, but there are several other uh, appliances. And what it does is it moves the lower jaw forward. And it, uh, the mandible, it moves it forward. And with the mandible, the tongue, the genioglossus moves forward and allows better airflow behind the genioglossus. It is much I, I, I can't say that it's convenient, but it's much less inconvenient than uh, CPAP. So we, we took, it, it was a small study, we took 16 patients, but it was a very long study. We followed them up for uh, one year. We studied them at baseline after three months of treatment, after, after one year of treatment, and then after uh, uh, ceasing uh, treatment again. Six of them had severe sleep apnea. Six of them had already uh, have uh, hypertension. And look at the results. And I think this is a, this is a very, very uh, important uh, concept. And the, um, 
the anterior mandibular device or the oral appliances are not as good as CPAP. And the treatment, you, you see the apnea hypopnea index improved, but did not improve to a level of controlling the disease as we have with the CPAP. So reducing the apnea hypopnea index from 29 to 18 uh, after three months and to, to 19 after one year of follow-up definitely improved their sleep apnea. But if we take a patient and study him at, at any time point and we see 18 or 19 or 20 uh, apnea hypopnea index, we will still say that this patient suffers from sleep apnea. Yet, despite the fact that we did not uh, cure sleep apnea, we only improved it, look what happened to the endothelial function. This is the endothelial function at baseline after three months, after one year. Endothelial function dramatically improved despite of residual sleep apnea. And this is, <clears throat> I think, very important. There was a, a, a nice positive correlation between the degree of improvement in the sleep apnea and the degree of the improvement in uh, endothelial function. So what we concluded from that study was that the mandibular advancement splint or the herbs uh, oral appliance is an effective treatment in patients with sleep apnea at least for one year of follow-up, improving both breathing and endothelial function. The correlation between the improvement in apnea indices and endothelial function suggests that the res respiratory abnormality causes the vascular abnormality and improvement in the endothelial function to control levels like, like uh, healthies without a complete uh, elimination of apneic events suggest a threshold effect of sleep apnea on endothelial function. And I want to conclude my talk. I see that, that uh, the food is coming in. So sleep apnea is strongly associated with cardiovascular uh, disease. The interim mechanism is endothelial function. I didn't uh, show all the data, but there is much more than what I had time to show. Endothelial dysfunction in obstructive sleep apnea results from both hypoxemia, reoxygenation, and sympathetic activation. Again, I had to skip uh, showing these data, but there are a lot of uh, studies uh, supporting this. Treatment of obstructive sleep apnea reverses endothelial dysfunction if treated early and reduces cardiovascular complication. There is a nice uh, uh, New England uh, uh, study about it about a year and a half uh, ago. And finally, there is a threshold effect of obstructive sleep apnea on endothelial dysfunction and even, and even suboptimal treatment may be advantageous. Thank you very much.